It's the morning star drive on 17.8 You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion Nobody can stop me when I'm like this I got my head in the zone, you know I'm on the morning star drive, you know Hey guys, how's it going? It's Tuesday, June 22nd, and this is the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. We're on YouTube, so make sure to subscribe, follow us on SoundCloud, and make sure to support us on Patreon. So what is going on today on this wonderful, terrific Tuesday? We'll get some coronavirus updates, current news from around the world, and of course, looking into the book of Job. All right, guys, so something is missing from today's broadcast, and it's going to be the best class ever. There, Sean, uh, Jusung McMillan will be taking a small break, probably for about three weeks, and then he'll be coming back into it again. So I hope you guys, um, you know, value what we have for now. He did an entire year, and hope you guys really, really enjoyed that too. And then hopefully he'll come back uh, with some even better better additions for the future. So how was your Monday, guys? It's already the beginning of Tuesday. Hope you guys are enjoying the week so far. We're already into it. And thankful that you guys are joining us here on the Morning Star Drive. So keep liking and commenting. I want to hear from you guys and see how you are doing. So what is happening tonight? It's going to be another Lab 78. And what am I going to talk about? I think I'm going to talk about my very first exorcism. Okay, so this is something like, oh, like this sounds pretty scary and crazy. And it is kind of scary and crazy. Uh, also, remember last Sunday edition, we met Edward Choi from Australia. Uh, great interview, learning about his journey into this history as a second gen. He's only 20 years old. Fun and insightful interview, so I hope you guys really enjoy it. So make sure to check out the Sunday edition this week. Also, uh, Monday Zoom Bible studies, they have concluded. So we've done about 28 weeks of it, and uh, we're going to take a two-week break. And then on July 5th, we're going to do a restart uh, Monday night, 7.30 p.m. Malaysia time. Those of you guys want to join live, go ahead. Bring your newcomers. We're going to start from the very beginning. Um and of course, um, instead of the Monday Night Bible Study, we do have another new section there. It is Q&A. So this is kind of cool because we finished the section on, we finished um, Bible Study, uh, the, the Zoom Bible Studies, but now we have newcomers Q&A. So it's going to be me answering their questions on the fly, just seeing what they're going through. And we just through, went through an amazing Q&A uh, on Sunday. So I'm going to post that up today. And it's going to be questions like, so who do you think he is, right? Or uh, I don't understand what does it mean that Jesus and uh, like very, very good insight about what his pastor said about uh, Jesus being tempted in the desert. And it's really interesting, even for me, I'm really excited about it, about it because it's the first time I heard that question. I'm just waiting on the Holy Spirit to give the answer for that one too, all right? So that is it uh, for that news. So let's get this show started on the road on this terrific Tuesday. Uh, who is it? Feature Arts of the Day. The featured artist is Kuma Chung from Japan, and this song is Open My Eyes. That second song is from Juice Star Aiden Verdi from New Zealand with Cameron Fry Takes a Stand. And last but not least, PGY from the Paper Music Associates in Korea with the song Wherever. All right, guys, so make sure as we're on the 22nd day of the prayer condition that all of us really make sure that we set another condition and put a little prayer in for all the member artists from around the world. <laughs> Open the eyes, open the door, open my heart, make the cross against me. Open the eyes, open the door, open my heart, mirror it is my way. You and I they go, you and I they go, don't knock on my heart, you and I got them all, no, you and I, 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 I'm happy, 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 I'm happ
オープンでこう、オープンでこう、地域や社会の目線に立ち、発展に積極的に貢献しよう。近づいてこう、近づいてこう、全ての世代と距離を近く、親しく接したんだろう。僕を成そう。縛られてる心を捨ててこう。新し
달의 연날을 들으며 홀로 도시를 걸었어 당신이 없는 이 태원은 불빛은 하나없이 어두워요 여기엔 나 말고 아무도 없는 건가요 아무것도 보이지가 들리지가 않는 거예요 맞아요 도시는 지금 텅 비었어요 심장이 멈추어버린 내 차가운 가슴과 같아요 눈물이 떨어져 빗물과 하나가 됐을 때 머리를 울리는 당신의 외침이 들려 나의 이름을 불러 그러면 내가 너의 옆에 있을게 부르고 또 불러 그러면 네가 나의 옆에 있을 거야 보이지 않는다고 없는 게 아니니까 아무리 어두워도 내일은 오니까 태양의 등불은 어디에 나 있어줄게 그러니 울지마 
there you go. That is PGY from PMA in Korea with Wherever. Before that, Juice Star Aiden Verdi from New Zealand with Camera Frying Takes a Stand. And of course, the feature artist of the day, Kuma Chung from Japan with Open My Eyes. All right, guys, so let's get into some worldly news around the world. We'll start off with the coronavirus updates 179.2 million cases, 3.8 million deaths, and the mortality rate has gone up to 2.17% globally. Uh, top five countries going by daily infection rates. We have India on top with 29.9 million cases, 388,000 deaths. Brazil, 17.9 million cases. And we heard yesterday they have topped the 500,000 death mark at 501,000. Russia, 5.3 million cases, 129,000 deaths. Argentina, 4.2 million cases, 89,000. And Colombia, 3.9 million cases and 99,990 somewhat deaths. So by tomorrow, we're going to see over 100,000 deaths over there in Colombia. Let's take a look at daily infection rates. Uh, India, 53,000 cases in a day. Brazil with 44,000. Colombia, 27,000 cases in a day. Russia was 17. And of course, guess what, guys? New person coming into the mix. Who is it? It is actually Indonesia. Right, Indonesia comes into the mix. New, new, new country in the top five with 13,000 cases, and they're also from Southeast Asia, where I'm at right now, which means Indonesia is also top in Southeast Asia with 13,000, and then the Philippines with 5,800, and then Malaysia over here with 5,200 cases in a day. So let's get into the current news. Top three current news. We're gonna move over to Japan in Tokyo, where the Olympics are being held, and a Ugandan athlete tests positive for coronavirus in Japan. So a member of Uganda's Olympic squad has become the first to test positive for coronavirus on arrival in Japan for the competition due to start on July 23rd. The event was postponed last year, but is now going ahead despite a fresh wave of coronavirus cases in Japan. Uganda is also experiencing a surge in cases, which forced the government to tighten lockdown measures on Friday, and the unnamed Ugandan was part of a nine-member squad who had been fully vaccinated, reports said. The group, which included boxers, coaches, and officials, had also tested negative before leaving Uganda. However, one of them tested positive on arrival at Tokyo's Narita Airport on Saturday and was quarantined at a government-designated facility. And Japan, Japanese officials were quoted by local media are saying. So the rest of the squad left by charter bus for Osaka in western Japan were there to train ahead of the games and the Ugandans were the second group of foreign athletes to arrive for training ahead of the competition. Uh, the Australian women's softball squad arrived on June 1st. Now foreign spectators have been banned from the Olympics and a decision is, is expected to be taken on Monday on whether to allow domestic spectators. Now there is high public uh, skepticism over the games. Uh, having no spectators at the games is the least risky option, Japanese medical experts have said, but other Japanese officials have indicated they want domestic fans to attend if possible. So Tokyo reported 376 cases of COVID and one death on 20th June, 72 more than a week ago, and the privately owned uh, the Asahi Shimbun newspaper reported. Now, polls and local media suggest public skepticism about the games taking place remains high amid a slow vaccine rollout, um, and only about 16% of Japan's population has received a COVID, um, a COVID vaccination dose so far according to Reuters news agency. Now, officials and volunteers working on the game started receiving vaccinations on Friday. And in Uganda, President Museveni announced a ban on road travel except for vehicles carrying tourists and workers in emergency and other essential services. He also closed schools, universities, and places of worship for 42 days. And the rest restrictions were necessary because of a more aggressive and sustained growth of the virus. Now, over the last three weeks, uh, the daily number of people testing positive had risen from less than 100 to more than 1,700. So they're experiencing very high hospitalization rates and deaths for COVID-19 patients among all age categories. And this is what the president said of Uganda. Now, second on the news uh, is about what's happening in Hong Kong. So there's a the newspaper called The Apple Daily. It's a Hong Kong pro-democracy paper, and it could be shut down within days, says an advisor. Hong Kong pro-democracy paper Apple Daily could be forced to shut down in a matter of days, uh, said an advisor of the paper's jailed founder, Jimmy Lai. Now, authorities last week froze $18 million in 18 Hong Kong million Hong Kong dollars of assets owned by three companies li linked to Apple Daily. Uh, Mark Simon told the BBC that the paper could do nothing while none of its bank accounts are functioning. So Apple Daily, a well-read tabloid, is frequently critical of Hong Kong and mainland Chinese leadership. Now, 
If you don't have any money, obviously you can't do anything. So most importantly, you can't promise to pay people when you don't have access to the cash to cover those expenses. And basically that's illegal in Hong Kong. So the paper is still on the newsstands today, but it is only a matter of days before it won't be there unless its bank accounts are unfrozen. So the paper's publisher, Next Digital, is holding a board meeting on Monday to discuss the paper's future. And Apple Daily had on Sunday uh, said it only had enough cash to continue normal operations for several weeks. And what has happened, uh, so what has happened to Apple Daily? Last Thursday, 500 police officers raided the offices of Apple Daily in Hong Kong, saying its reports had breached the national security law, and police also arrested the editor-in-chief and four other executives at their homes and froze $18 million in Hong Kong dollars of assets owned by three companies linked to the Apple Daily, uh, Apple Daily Limited, Apple Daily Printing Limited, and AD Internet Limited. So fo photos published online by Apple Daily showed police going through reporters' computers, and in a statement, police said that their warrant covered the power of searching and seizure of journalistic materials and in a press briefing later that day police said the apple daily had published more than 30 articles calling on countries to impose sanctions on hong kong and mainland china since 2019 and jimmy Lai, the paper's founder is currently in jail for a series of charges including participating in an unauthorized assembly in 2019 so who is jimmy Lai? Lai is one of the most prominent supporters of hong kong's pro-democracy movement estimated to be worth more than a billion dollars us and he made his initial fortune in the clothing industry and later ventured into media and founded next digital so in may authorities froze assets belonging to Lai, including his bank accounts and his stake of 71 percent in Next Digital, estimated to be worth about $45 million. And banking giants HSBC and Citibank were also sent letters by Hong Kong security chief who threatened up to seven years jail for any dealings with Mr. Lai's accounts in the city. And his last interview with the BBC before he was sentenced to jail, he said he would not give in to intimidation. And... Um, so basically, this is what China is doing right now, especially because of national security law that was introduced in uh, 2020. And that was in response to massive pro-democracy protests that swept the city, uh, city state uh, the previous year. So basically, uh, it essentially reduced Hong Kong's judicial autonomy and made it easier to punish demonstrator, right? So Beijing said the law would target sedition and bring stability. But critics say uh, it violates the agreement under which Britain handed back Hong Kong to China in 1997. So since the law was enacted in June, uh, more than 100 people have been arrested under its provisions, including Jimmy Lai. Okay, so that's what's going in Hong Kong. Really sad to see um, that you know, freedom of speech and this pro-democracy is being held down right now. So a lot of prayers, especially for those that are uh, running in the churches in Hong Kong right now. Last but not least, uh, we're going to go to Chile. Now, Chile is to begin drafting a new constitution next month. So President Pinera says assembly draft uh, the, says the assembly is drafting new a new constitution to replace the Pinochet era charter and it will begin work on July 4th. So Chilean President Sebastian Pinera has said the assembly to draft a new constitution will hold its first sessions on July 4th as the South American country moves towards replacing its current conservative dictatorship era charter. So the rewriting of the constitution is a result of a broad political consensus agreed to after the widespread social protests that broke out at the end of 2019 against inequality. And uh, this convention undoubtedly represents a great opportunity to achieve a new constitution that will be recognized and respected by all Chileans under a framework of unity and stability toward the future for our, for democracy, Panera said on Sunday. And over the course of nine months, uh, the 155-member drafting body will have to balance a popular clamor for profound social change with the need to maintain a robust economy as it rewrites the old constitution, which dates from the rule of Augusto Pinochet. Now, their term could be extended for three months more, and the body will need a two-thirds majority to approve the draft that will be put to a national referendum next year, in which voting will be mandatory. So Chile's existing constitution dates from 1980, enacted at the height of Pinochet's 1973-1990 rule, and limits the role of the state while bolstering private enterprise, and many Chileans blame it for the deep-rooted gulf between rich and poor, but it is hailed by others mainly on the right for the country's many decades of economic growth. So in choosing the body to write the new charter, voters in May turn their backs on traditional political parties and flock to independent candidates with no party affiliation, but mostly left-wing or socialist ideals. So many of the independent candidates, uh, an assortment of teachers, writers, journalists, lawyers, and activists were involved in 
or inspired by the 2019 uprisings and campaigned with promise of social change. So that is something very, very interesting. That's an entire new constitution in Chile. So let's hope that uh, things are happening according to what God wants in that country. All right, guys. So that is the top three news for today. Hope you guys really uh, uh, were able to see a little bit more of what God was doing, which means it brings us into the final part. Well, not final part. We ended the, the worldly news. We're going to go into something a little bit more spiritual. So we're going to start off with the gates of the wedding banquet have opened to connection and then heard in God's ears. And I hope that everyone here will just spend this time in just giving glory, honor, and praise to the Holy Trinity.
That is Heard in God's Ears. Oh, one of my favorite songs. So really, really thankful uh, that uh, we have this recording team, the IETT and uh, Pravi, you know, the Pravi music team uh, making great recordings. I'm really thankful. And the singer is just amazing. Uh, before that was Connection and the gates of the wedding banquet have opened. All right, guys. So now it's time for it's Tuesday's, what you call it. It's Tuesday's word study. And Tuesday, we're going to always be going into the scripture for the week. And of course, this week, we're going into the book of Job, interestingly. Okay. So um, the couple of interesting facts you need to know about the book of Job are quite amazing too. Number one is the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Yes, guys, it is the oldest book in the in the Bible. Uh, the author of the book of Job also is unknown, right? So it's not Job that actually wrote it. And of course, at a time when it was believed the earth sat on a large animal, like you know, this this is kind of what they believed back then. They thought the earth sat on a large animal or on a giant, like fifteen hundred years before Christ. But the Bible spoke of the earth's flea. A free floating space. And of course, uh, we use this in one of the lectures for rapture in the past. Um, that's in Job 26, verse 7. And science didn't even discover that the earth hangs on nothing until 1650, which is like like uh, one, 2,000, 2, 2, over 2,100 years later, right? 
Uh, the book of Job also mentions Adam, which is evidence that the story of Adam and Eve was recognized long before Moses' birth, and the book of Genesis was written, um, and before the book of Genesis. And the, the book of Job also deals with the question of the righteous having to suffer. Uh, Job had 10 children, seven sons, three daughters, who were all killed in his first test. And the book mentions that the ocean contains springs in Job 38, 16. And that is interesting because the existence of water springs in the oceans was not discovered by scientists until 1970. So that's quite amazing too. And uh, another interesting fact is the book is evidence that Satan is not a Christian invention but has been recognized long before Christianity. And that was talked about in Job chapter one, because remember, this is the oldest book in the Bible. So it's saying that this was predating uh, the, the writings of uh, Genesis. Okay. So that is a couple of interesting things about the book of Job, but let's first get into some historical context. Okay. What about the book of Job? So first and foremost, um, determining the time and place of the book's composition is bound up with the nature of the book's language, so how it was written, okay? So the Hebrew prose of the frame tale, notwithstanding many classic features, shows that it was composed in the post-Babylonian era. So that's after 540 BCE, and the poetic core of the book is written in a highly literate and literary Hebrew. So um, just the way that it's written and not written very well in some areas, suggests that Hebrew was a learned and not native language of the person who wrote or the poet that wrote this. So the numerous words and grammatical shadings of Aramaic spread throughout the mainly Hebrew text of Job make a setting in like, it's like more of a Persian era. Uh, and they make it, it's fairly certain it's in the Persian era. So anywhere from like 540 to 330 BCE. And it was only in that period that Aramaic became a major language throughout the um throughout, uh, throughout that, uh, those regions. And the poet depends on an audience that will pick up on subtle signs of Aramaic. So a geographic setting in the land of Israel, in the Persian province of Yehud, is also fairly certain that that's where, it's, it's, you know, that's where it is, the region. And the Transjordan is referred to as the East Kedem, and the Jordan River is mentioned in uh, Job chapter 40. Now, the author displays a familiar, familiarity with several Semitic languages, like Phoenician, Ar Arabic, and even Babylonian, in addition to Aramaic. And an acquaintance with local Canaanite mythology and some genres of Mesopotamian literature, such as, uh, like, you're going to see it inside uh, the book of Job, some mythology and Mesopotamian literature, right? So, like, descriptions of gods, right? So, uh and incantations for the ease of childbirth, right? And these are things that have to do with Canaanite mythology and also in Mesopotamian liter literature. It's not in the Hebrew, right? And several words and expressions can be properly understood only when foreign languages are brought into play. So the poet appears to be like a, a, a polymath and whose knowledge of, of language, literature, um, about uh, animals, plants, law, astronomy, anatomy, is very, very impressive. And most impressive, however, is his deep and wide familiarity with earlier works of Hebrew literature. And he draws on numerous sources and he kind of dazzles like, kind of like Shakespeare with very, like the vocabulary is very, is quite amazing and a penchant for linguistic innovation in words, forms, and combinations, right? So the author, we still don't know who it is, right? Most of the book consists of the words of Job and his friends, but Job himself was not the author. And we may be sure that the author was an Israelite uh, since he, not Job or his friends, frequently uses the Israelite covenant name for God, Yahweh, right? And in the prologue, uh, Divine discourse is an epilogue. Lord occurs a total of like 25 times, while in the rest of the book, it appears only once, right? So this uh, unknown author probably had access to a tradition of oral or written, um, oral or written about ancient righteous man, about some ancient righteous man who endured great suffering with remarkable perseverance, right? And uh, he was someone who did not turn against God and a tradition he put to use for his own purposes while the author preserves much of the archaic and non-Israelite flavor in the language of Job and his friends, he also reveals his own style of a writer of wisdom literature, right? So the book's profound insights, its, it's literary structures, quality of its rhetoric display, the author's genius, right? So this guy is quite amazing writer. Uh, if you look at the setting and perspective of the book, um, 
Yeah, so it may be that the author intended this book to be a contribution to an ongoing high-level discussion of major theological issues in an exclusive company of learned people, right? So a lot of educated people, and they're just making a, a major theological issue and discussion, right? But it seems more likely that he intended his story to be told to godly sufferers who, like Job, were struggling with the crisis of faith brought on by prolonged bitter suffering. Right, So he seems uh, to sit too close to the suffering to be more the sympathetic and compassionate like pastor than the detached theologian or philosopher. And uh, he has heard what the learned theologians of his day have been saying about the ways of God and what brings on suffering. And he lets their voices uh, be heard. And he knows that the godly sufferers of his day have also heard the wisdom of the learned and have internalized it as the wisdom of the ages, but also knows what miserable comfort that so-called wisdom gives, that it kind of only rubs salt in the wounds and creates kind of a stumbling block for faith, right? So uh, against that wisdom, he has no rational arguments to marshal, but he has a story to tell that challenges it at its very roots and speaks to the struggling faith of the sufferer. And in effect, he says to the godly sufferer, forget the logical arguments spun out by those who sit together at their ease and discuss the ways of God and forget those voices in your own heart uh, that are little more than echoes of their pronouncements and he's basically saying, let me tell you a story. So uh, it's very interesting because Job is what you call the exact opposite of Solomon's Ecclesiastes, right? And it's very good because it's like the exact opposite extreme where one side of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, what's Solomon doing? He's telling you that all the materials and goods and all the entertainments and pleasures in life are all meaningless. And then it tells you that being at the extreme of richness and having everything you want is still not enough and that you need God. And on the flip side, Job is kind of on the on the other side. And Job talks about on the on the far extreme of being poor and suffering, you still need God. Right? So uh, it, it is very interesting because you could look at two sides now. One side telling you that, you know, the people who are rich, you can um, turn them to uh, Solomon's story. And the people who are going through suffering can turn them to uh, Job's story too. And of course, in the end, God redeems him and blesses him double of what he had before. So that is quite interesting too when you when you look at the, the differences between the extremes of Job and Ecclesiastes. And it's good because if we only had Ecclesiastes, we would, you know, how many people have actually gone to the extreme of receiving everything they want, all the material and pleasures they want? It's very, very few people in this world. However, there are many people who actually know the suffering more than they know the pleasures and the riches and the materials. And that's why we can look at those two books as uh, extremes of each other. And it helps us to explain what is going on in the lives of these people, right? So I hope that uh, that uh, is a good word study for you guys on the book of Job. I hope that it kind of gave you some insight of who the author is, even though we don't know exactly who it is, but it wasn't Job. It is the oldest book in the entire Bible, which, you know, like I was saying in the very beginning, uh, he already talks about Adam. Uh, he already mentions like Satan, right? So this is even before the Christian invention or like, well, not invention, but the Christians even brought about Satan, it was some, Satan was something already discussed and talked about and believed about even before the Genesis times, right? Well, not before Genesis was written, before Moses did, right? So very, very interesting. I hope you guys really uh, enjoyed that time. Uh, that is the word study for today, uh, which means that now we can get into uh, a time of uh, the song of the day. And what is today's song of the day? I'm going to go back to uh, a group of mine I really like. They do a lot of covers. It's uh, Love Travel Music. And they are, were originally a Canadian band called the Moffats. And now they do, like, they go around the world doing these covers. And uh, they're going to cover a song from Savage Garden called I Knew I Loved You. So I hope you guys really enjoy this. I love the original too, but this one is really good also. So this is Love Travel Music with I Knew I Loved You. <laughs> There's a snow rhyme or reason 
sense of completion And in your eyes I see the missing pieces I'm searching for, I think I found my way home And I know that it might sound more than a little crazy But I believe I knew I loved you before I met you I think I dreamed you into life I knew I loved you before I met you I have been waiting all of my life Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah Oh, I knew I loved you before I met you travel music with i knew i loved you and that's a cover from savage garden hope you guys really enjoyed that and of course i that reminds me all the way back in my high school days but uh uh really really enjoyed that song by love travel music all right guys uh this is going to bring us into the last segment for today and of course i told you before uh sean jusak mcmillan is after he's did he's done like a year of best class ever uh, he'll be taking a short break and then we'll see him again uh, probably in the next two to three weeks maybe uh middle of july all right so let's take a look at what are the things that i've been thinking about these couple of days and interestingly uh, the thing that I've been thinking about lately is about organizational culture. Now, that's something that I'm researching a lot because uh, one of the things I did see as I was growing up in Providence, and you never know it when you're young because you're just excited to be in this history, but as you move up through leadership, uh, you'll notice that um, Providence has a certain culture. Like, there's Providence culture, and that's one thing. And then there's a culture that your church fosters, right, which is completely different. And it's like, I was like, wow, that's interesting. And an organizational culture or your church culture uh, is basically the traits that your church has uh, in the way that we behave, right? In, in certain situations, okay? So let me give an example of like, uh, and the, the thing that I thought was really cool is how to identify the traits of your culture. So it's basically, if your traits are really good, then you'll, you'll have a strong, great culture. And if your traits are not good and they're negative, then it means that you have a very bad culture in your church or organization, whatever it is, right? So it, it is quite interesting because I was looking at it, it's like, yeah, you know, we should be able to assess our churches and see um, what it's like, right? What kind, of, what kind of like traits does your culture have in your church, your family, organization, your work, whatever it is. Like for instance, um, we can look at a certain trait is, like the overall feeling. For instance, uh, are people generally very happy and joyful to be in this history? Or do they feel more pressure? Like pressure and guilt and like, oh my gosh, I gotta do this and this. Oh, I feel so guilty for not doing this. Like, is it a more of a positive side or is it negative? Do people feel that genuine joy or um, genuine joy and happiness being in the history of God? Uh, the different things we have to do, of course, there's many different things we have to do in Providence. Like, you know, we have pre-dawn and other, other different things. Uh, the feeling you have from it, is it obligation or is it because you really love? And there's another thing that you have to look at is the, genu the general public of your church or organization, do they, feel, uh, do they feel like it's a job so it's very difficult to do and it's really hard or do they genuinely feel like doing this out of love? Um, are people... Do people feel pressured, 
right, to do things or do they feel like willing to? Like here's, here's a great one too. Whenever you have uh, like events or something going on, are people generally willing to volunteer their time for the church for this event? Or are they usually shying away from it and you always have the same people doing the work for every single event, right? You know, like I know some churches, like it's always the same people doing the work and very, very few people actually volunteer or, or even try to help in some way. Now, what does that mean? Trying to help in some way means like, for instance, some people may not have time to go, but they'll say, you know what, can I pray, what can I pray for this? Or another person like, like volunteering and saying, hey, uh, I don't have uh, time, uh, but I can definitely uh, financially help. Or, you know, there's a lot of different things people can volunteer to like, do they have that willingness in their heart, really wanting to do it? Or do people kind of like, go off into their own lives? Like, ah, when church is kind of that feeling is separated from uh, their other life. And these are a couple of things that we can look at to see uh, what is the general culture. Like, you know, of course, there is supposed to be that perfect ideal culture that's supposed to be in Providence, that Providence ideal world. God is here, the God's will, fulfilling God's will, uh, fulfilling the purpose of creation. Of course, they have that. But then there's going to be the reality, right? The reality of how, how does your church, what is your church culture really like? And it's, these are some things that you do have to identify. And what we have, what we need to understand is like one thing I find very interesting is uh, when I ask people, like a lot of leaders here and there, and this is myself too, like this is me in the past before I did a lot of research, is we think to ourselves like, oh, what's the problem? Why aren't they going to pre dawn? Why is it like this? Why is it like that? And the answer is not because they didn't pray. The answer is not because they don't go to pre dawn or because they don't know the Lord. You know, that's they don't know the Lord properly. And these are all like the textbook answers that everyone gives, but a lot of people are not understanding like what culture really is and why people are not buying in. And we have to realize is like, for instance, one person told me like, oh, how do you get people to do it? And it's like, oh, if the leaders do it first, then everyone else should do it right after. And the answer is no way. I've been a head leader myself. And just because I'm never late for a meeting doesn't mean that Oh, our head leader is not late for a meeting. So that means I'm not going to be late. It doesn't work like that. It's actually kind of weird because a head leader, even if the head leader's early, uh, it doesn't mean the rest of the group is going to uh, come early. But the interesting thing is, if the head leader's late, people will call them out on it. It's kind of unfair, right? But it doesn't work the way like, oh, if the head leader comes to pre then everyone goes to pre -dawn. And the answer is, no way. It doesn't work like that. Like the human condition, the human mind doesn't work in that way. Is just because the leader does it, everyone follows suit. If that was the case, then every church, like even for me, when I was head leading uh, New York, I believe I missed... The only time I missed is when I was sick and I was late once in three and a half years. Does that mean that majority of us came to pre -dawn? Absolutely not. Because that's, you know, that's, you know, that's something that is, uh, that, that tells like the level of the leader or the integrity of the leader. However, it's not going to convince people to all start coming to pre -dawn. It's not enough. And we have to realize is one thing I, I realize a lot by doing research and seeing, um, all the things that I've studied is these, the, when you look at the highest level of how people research and study and see how, you know, how to make organizational culture, how to change culture. The interesting thing is the more I study, the more I look at like Pastor Joan from 2010, 11 from the Lord's Church, I'm like, that's exactly what she did. And when you look at the highest level of everything, they are all doing it the same way. And this is kind of what Sunseem said in the past. Sunseem said the, the people that know his Shimjung the best are CEOs. And he says, the reason why they know my heart the best is the people who go through the most difficulty and overcome, they're going to reach a level of truth that is far beyond other people. And this is why those people like CEOs who went through everything to become the top, he says, those people, something you can say one proverb and they understand everything about it. But then if it's us, if we haven't gone through the struggle, if we don't know, if we're, if, we're some, if we're people that didn't have those experiences and really overcame, we won't understand those problems. We're like, oh, what does that mean? And that's why Sunseem said that, yeah, the CEOs and these big, big people know them the best because all big people are at that level and they can realize at that level. And 
We have to realize, even when it comes to research and the things that people do to be successful, when you research, it's not like people are making up things. People research to see through human context, psychology, philosophy, nature, social context, sociology, whatever it is, they see, ah, this is how the brain works and this is what works best with human beings, which means that everyone at that high level who's leading people are all gonna realize at a deep level. And that's why when you study these things, how to change your church culture, what's the thing a leader can do? You know, it's not just, hey, if you do it, everyone else does it. It doesn't work that way. Because I don't know, how about you guys? Some of you that have struggled with pre-dawn, do you guys sit there saying, oh, my head leader goes, so I have to... No, we're not inspired by that. Even when I did 40 days of seven hours of prayer, uh, seven hours a day of prayer condition, it didn't inspire anyone else to do it. No one else did it. They just said, wow, you're doing it. And that's it. And we have to realize that um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that have already been researched at very, very high levels. And when you finally study it, the interesting thing is, you'll see that Pastor Joan, it's exactly what Pastor Joan and Sunseem does. It's like, that's what they teach. And you're like, oh. So that's what they teach, but you learn in the, you know, you learn by all this research and what people have done. You're like, oh, and they're researching the how, right? You know, like when we learn in the message, we learn what, like the whys and the what. And then we're the ones that have to put into action. But a lot of these things have already been researched. And we have to realize even more uh, that if we, like, for instance, when it comes to, to, to church culture, the culture of your church, uh, you have to identify what your cultural traits are in your organization, in your churches. And you have to be able, you have to understand whether you have a good culture or a bad culture. This has nothing to do with Pravi culture, right? Pravi culture is the most ideal what we're striving towards. But along the way, we'll realize that a lot of times, like for instance, example is, um, we may say that love is the greatest thing in, in our church. Love is the greatest thing. But the interesting thing is, is at the end of the year, like no one gives awards for love. You only get awards if you evangelized or not. But then again, there's other people that evangelize just as hard, but does that mean they're worse because they didn't actually like find someone who's, who got evangelized? No, like even those people put in a lot of effort too. And everyone needs to be recognized. So if we're talking about love, love is very, it includes so many people, but it seems like, you know, when we look at the way that our church runs, uh, we have to start to identify these things. Oh, do we have this type of trait or that? Do we have a joyful, loving trait? When people walk into the church, they're so happy. Or do people feel pressure? Do people feel guilt? People don't feel happy. They don't feel no joy. People feel like if they don't evangelize, they're nothing, right? Like what should be it? And this has a direct effect on the atmosphere, the culture, and how successful your church actually becomes. Where, if anything else, we need to build a church with a culture that has the, the culture that builds an atmosphere for salvation and rapture. And if we can do that, then people will just want to be there because it's such an amazing place to be. And we have to realize, you know, church is more than just pre-dawn. It's more than just all these things. Where if we only think about church as the things we need to do, going to pre-dawn for church, going to service for church, then it becomes like an obligation or a job. And then people just don't want to go. It's just not fun. It's just not inspiring. But we have to be those that understand that if we're going to change culture and change things around, we have to do it in a different way. And we have to learn how to change your organization, your church's culture. And like, I'll give you one example that I learned is, imagine you go to two jobs, right? One of the cultures in the jobs is for the managers to point out what is wrong. Hey, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And it's a very pressurized, you feel guilty and you're always scared when the manager comes around, right? In the same way too, what about if leaders only come to you when they want something? right? Or they only come to you to rebuke you. Then you're going to be trained that whenever they come around, you're going to be scared because all they do is rebuke and get mad at you. That would be the culture that it's building. The behavior that it builds is leaders coming, everyone be scared. Or, right? What if you go to a job that the culture there is the leaders always come around trying to help you to do better? Hey, is there anything I can do to help you? Is there anything I can do to make it easier for you? Is there anything I can do so you can do a better job? And those are two different types of leadership styles that builds two different types of cultures. 
One is very scared, fear, a lot of cortisol in your brain, and uh, you know, you're in the fight or flight mode all the time. Scared you might be fired any time. Then you have the other style, which is very loving and caring and always wanting to help you to do better. And this is what uh, allows us to become even better at our job or better in what we do, and we love to be at those jobs. And you know, when I say business, of course, business, we talk about money, but technically speaking, you know, Sunseam also calls Providence is like, you know, a parable is like a business, the business of life, the farming of life, right? Business of life. But if you take a look at an organization, organizations include churches and nonprofits and businesses and everything, right? And when you look at the, the organization, uh, the culture, the cultural organization, the organizational culture of your church or the organization organizations you're in, you will see there's a different mindset of the way that your mind twitches or reacts to certain situations when the leader comes, when he goes, when when this happens or when that happens. And we have to be those that can recognize and identify what our cultures are like and start studying and learning how to change the organizational culture or the church culture. Okay, so that's something I was studying and I thought it was really, really interesting. So I wanted to share that with you guys here. So um, that is the last segment for today. Hope you guys really enjoyed this. And now you could kind of say that that is a kind of a, what you would call it. That's like kind of a best class ever segment too. So hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, it's Tuesday. Have a wonderful day, guys. And looking forward to meeting you guys again tomorrow morning on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. It's the morning star drive on 17.8 You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind I'm burning with desire and the passion Nobody can stop me when I'm like this I got my head in the zone, you know I'm on the morning star drive, you know I'm burning with desire and the passion Nobody can stop me when I'm like this I got my head in the zone, you know I'm on the morning star drive, you know